topic for this session is constitution as promised the speaker for this session is uh, dr Andy. prabhash j so uh, and dr prabhash j is a uh, former pro vice chancellor university of kerala and former head of the department university university political science department, department, department university of kerala, kerala. Okay. and he is uh, uh, a visiting fellow of the university of new south wales australia australia the chair for this chair session, for session is dr anu unni assistant professor department of political science university, university of kerala so i invite sir dr anu unni to chair this session and dr anu unni please dr anu unni please Thank you, uh, Nirmal. <clears throat> I hope Prabhat sir has joined. Okay. Um, dear all, we are uh, moving to the sixth uh, um, session of this uh, two-day national uh, webinar. We had an excellent session now with the uh, with the uh, PDT Ajari on uh, parliamentary democracy and uh, constitutional uh, morality. Um, uh, the speaker of this session is uh, none other than uh, Prabhar sir. Um, I don't have to introduce Prabhar sir to this esteemed uh, gathering because he's uh, uh, one among us. Um, though he himself preferred to be called a retired teacher from the Department of Political Science, we all know that he's much more than that. As an administrator and as an academic, he has uh, uh, proved his uh, substance. Uh, as you all know, he was the pro vice chancellor of the uh, University of Kerala. He was uh, also the special um, uh, officer for uh, Open University. So uh, in different fields, he has uh, uh, proved his uh, merit. When, uh, I was actually uh, fortunate enough to spend some years in the department uh, with the Prabhar sir. When he was there, he used to tell us that, you know, after his uh, retirement, he would uh, get more time to engage with his uh, um, uh, academics because uh, uh, I think uh, that is uh, very true when he, when we look at his uh, works in these days. After retirement, he has got enough time to uh, write in uh, um, uh, newspapers, different magazines. He constantly engages with us. Uh, once an academic is always an academic and uh, uh, Prabhar sir is actually a testimony to that because uh, he, uh, even after his re formal retirement from the institution, he keeps engages with us through his uh, um, articles, uh, his uh, academic activism. So that uh, uh, makes Prabhar sir dear to all of us as a person at, at a personal level. Also, we all share very warm relationship with the. Uh, uh, Prabhar sir, I'm I'm sure that he won't uh, uh, he won't uh, uh, like uh, me to say all these things. But uh, uh, after a long time, we are uh, meeting. I mean, um, I think Prabhar sir is joining from his home, and I am here in uh, Kochi. Very nice to see you, sir, here uh, for this session. It's our pleasure and uh, uh, privilege to get you to speak on constitution as a promise. That's a uh, the topic he has delivered to uh, that he has um, uh, um, uh, agreed to deliver this talk. Um, constitution definitely it is a set of uh, uh, promises. Constitutions um, are the expressions of the intentions of a government to bind itself uh, to a set of rules and uh, principles. But most of the time we know that this, uh, um, in the absence of this uh, expression, definitely. Um, citizens uh, feel that their rights are um, not being protected, their rights are not being safeguarded, their rights are being violated. We are seeing a, a scenario like this. Yesterday, Professor Gudavarti was talking about the crisis of uh, constitutionalism, the crisis of uh, liberalism in India. We are moving towards a very illiberal uh, society. As responsible citizens, definitely we have the, uh, we have the responsibility to um, uh, put things on a uh, right uh, path. But to what extent we have had the opportunity for doing that or how things are being imposed from the above is a different question um, altogether. While um, uh, traditional forms of uh, originalism condemn that um, uh, constitutions are something, constitutions are something that has to be read or that has to be uh, interpreted according to the intentions of the constitution framers. 
um, constitution as a promise actually um, refute uh, this uh, claim. Um, to what extent these promises, many of the promises as far as Indian constitution is uh, concerned, the very promises that are given in the preamble, to what extent these are being fulfilled or any attempt is being uh, taken in order to uh, deliver on these promises. Even if an attempt is being made, to what extent uh, uh, the promiser and the promisee get into an agreement uh, on which uh, uh, these uh, promises, because many of the promises are very uh, vague in uh, nature. So how uh, both both the parties, the promiser and the promisee, go about it, how they deal about it, and what are the kinds of different strategies, the techniques that they probably use in order to reach into, in order to manufacture uh, the consensus um, on certain demands that uh, come up from the very uh, grassroots level. So on uh, all these things, especially in a time, the various aspects of democracy, whether it is uh, autonomy of the media, alternative sources of information, freedom of speech and expression, um, all these things are being um, challenged from different quarters. I think constitution is something that we have to um, 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 uh, uh, keep as a, a very sacred uh, document, which is a living document, and whether the life has gone away from it is the question that we are dealing yesterday. We were dealing yesterday and um, today. Definitely, Prabhasar will have more to talk about the Constitution as promised. Um, with a great pleasure, I'm welcoming you, sir, to this session. Thank you. Over Thank to you, you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I hope I, I, I hope. am audible. Yes, sir, you are audible. So most respected and dear uh, Dr. Anunni, dear colleagues in the Department of Political Science, and my dear friends and students. I thank the organizers of the seminar, particularly Dr. Uh, Arun Kumar and colleagues in the Department of Political Science for uh, inviting me to make this presentation. I remember a series of talks organized by the Center for Political Studies of the Jawaharlal Nehru University back in 2016. And I was privy to attend one of the talks. And the talk was delivered by Professor Gobal Guru. And the, and the series was on, uh, in, on nationalism. And the uh, talk which I have attended, which I was privy to attend, was delivered by Professor Gobal Guru. And Gobal Guru said that, while speaking about nation, nationalism, etc., Guru said that a nation is to be imagined in terms of the profit, the, in terms of the promise it makes. The promise of a nation is nothing but democracy. These are the words which Professor Guru said, though, in, said in, in, in that talk. And Guru's idea about democracy and its promises resonates well with uh, Jacques Derrida's concept of democracy. Because whenever he speaks about democracy, he uses the words, I quote, democracy to come. These are the words which he uh, use, which he uses to describe democracy, democracy to come. By that he means that democracy is an unfinished project. It moves from, uh, I mean, if I, if to, if to, to quote Hegel, from imperfection to perfection kind of a thing. So it moves from one promise to the, uh, to the other kind of a thing. So it's an unending, unending business. It's, it, it, it never stops. It's an evolutionary kind of a thing. And he says that uh, democracy must have the structure of a promise. Democracy must have the structure of a promise. And he identified two important promises of democracy as equality and freedom. Of course, freedom of various sorts freedom of press, freedom of expression, uh, freedom of religion, things like that. But he identified these two, equality and freedom, as the foundational promises of uh, democracy. And, uh, and to him, the promise of democracy is reflected in the Constitution, as I knew Unni was telling, in the preambular kind of approach, the promises are, uh, are, are reflected. Come to the Indian Constitution, the promises of the Indian Constitution. We know that the constitutional promises have actually a, a pre-constitutional existence, particularly that is in the in the tradition of India, particularly 
the dissenting traditions, the dissenting movements that were organized by the subordinate sections of the Indian society. Take for, take for example, the Bhakti movement of the 6th and 7th century AD, it started in the 6th and 7th century AD. You could see that even before the French Revolution articulated the concept of fraternity, uh, Bhakti movement articulated that concept. And Bhakti movement was not merely a movement against uh, Brahminical uh, Hinduism and the oppressive ways of the caste system. It was much more than that. It spoke about gender equality. It spoke against gender discrimination uh, kind of a thing, so on and so on and so forth. For example, uh, recall the contribution given by the contribution uh, made by Akka Mahadevi. Akka Mahadevi was the poetess, Kannada poetess of the 12th century uh, lady. She had made, I mean, uh, tremendous contribution to the idea of or promoting the idea of gender equality. And uh, and this uh, ideals that were reflected in the uh, Bhakti movement was later carried forward by other movements, similar movements organized in various parts of the country. For example, the movements organized by Srinana Guru and Ayengali in Kerala, Vasaveshara in, uh, in Karnataka, that is in the 12th century BC, AD, and then Pedia uh, Revi Ramaswami Nayagar in Tamil Nadu, or Jodhra Upule in in Maharashtra, to name just a, uh, just a few. And again, if you look at the Indian literary tradition, you could see that this uh, spirit of the constitution, these constitutional values, uh, are and were reflected in the Indian literary, uh, literary tradition, uh, tradition as well. See, for example, you take the novel. If you, if you uh, consider uh, An Manand Math, written by Bakim Chandra Chatterjee as the first novel, that was published in 1892. And five years later, we had in Malayalam the first novel, Kundalada by Apunarangadi. And seven years later, that is in, in 1820, 1889, we had uh, Indilega by uh, O. Chandamana and others. And so people belong to this tradition, people belong, various, various writers uh, had contributed, or, or in, the, in, the, in the writings, we could, we could find the reflection of the constitutional values, I mean, starting from for example, Eshpal, Prem Chand, uh, Sadhudas and Manto, uh, to name, I mean, uh, and in the coming to the pre or, or uh, Mar Nashan, and coming to the post independence uh, years, you could say in the same thing in uh, in uh, UR and the Murthy, for example, or Girish Kanar, or Mahashwada Devi, and, and, and others. So, all these writers uh, have, in one sense or other, reflected the constitutional values. So, what I mean to say is that. The, the values which were reflected in the constitution, the promises made by the constitution uh, was not just the contribution of the British or, 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 or it emerged out of the India's contract with the West and the British kind of thing. Definitely it played a very important role. But even before that, you could find the uh, reflection of these uh, values in the, uh, uh, in the, in the pre-independent Indian tradition, particularly in the um, movement that were organized by the subaltern sections of the society and coming to the constitution uh, the constitution uh, constitutional promises you could see that there are uh, many promises and most of these uh, some of these promises are right some of these promises uh, are commonplace kind of a thing therefore i don't want to go into the details uh, of such thing but then I, I i definitely want to discuss two important things because that is a bone of contention today uh, i mean i knew new, new was referring to that and also Sri Piriti Ajari was uh, referring to that. And one uh, uh, important thing that is reflected in the preamble, and that needs to be uh, looked at some length is the uh, invocation of the constitution, invocation of the constitution, uh, invocation of the preamble. Uh, see, the, the, there were three important schools of thought in the constant assembly at that particular point in time. One is that we should invoke the constitution in the name of the people of India. And that is ultimately that, 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 that carried the day. And the other two schools which need to be discussed uh, are one uh, school led by uh, Shibanlal Saxena. Uh, Shibanlal Saxena wanted the constitution, uh, the invocation of the constitution to begin with God and also Mahatma Gandhi. And the, 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 the next school, the, the, the second school that is uh, led by Pandit Govind Malavia. Pandit Govind Malavia, Malavia, uh, Malavia's idea was much more nuanced and more focused. And he wanted 
to start the constitution to invoke the constitution by use by uh, by uh, invoking the name of god see uh, shibalal saxena coming to the uh, the views ex expressed by shibalal saxena shibalal saxena uh, uh, made an amendment moved an amendment in the constituent assembly and the amendment read like this in the name of god the almighty under whose inspiration and guidance the father of the nation mahatma gandhi led the nation from slavery and then we the people of india resolves kind of a thing so he wanted both gandhi ji as well as god for invoking the uh, invoking invoking the constitution i will read once again in the name of god the almighty under whose inspiration and guidance the father of the nation mahatma gandhi led the nation from slavery and pandit govind malavia as i told you was much more uh, nuanced and he said he his uh, amendment the amendment which he had moved was very crisp and matter of fact it read like this i quote by the grace by the grace of parameshwar the supreme being the lord of the universe called different names by different peoples of the world we uh, we the people resolve, uh, resolves to constitute india etc etc so once again by the grace of parameshwar the supreme being the lord of the universe called by different names by different peoples of the world so this was what he uh, put forward or pandit govind malavia put forward and the framers of the constitution uh, uh, rejected both the arguments both both amendments both the viewpoints they said that we don't want to start the constitution we we don't want to invoke uh, the constitution by using the word god even though we are believers in we are believers in god we are religious people kind of a thing so these two things were rejected and here it's also uh, interesting to note another thing that is article 25 when you come to article 25 there is a right to propagation of religion is there and interestingly right to propagate religion was uh, that that idea was uh, put forward by a conservative hindu from gujarat k m munshi it was k m munshi who put forward the idea and and again interestingly the idea was opposed by a, a, a person who is supposed to be very progressive he was uh, only 26 years old when he was a member of the constituent assembly it was uh, uh, loknath loknath mishra and loknath mishra had a, a, a family i mean uh, his, fam his family and his family is interesting loknath mishra was the brother of ranganath mishra who was the chief justice of india later and ranganath mishra was the uncle of deepak mishra who also was the chief justice of india later later on so that uh, um, uh, the, the opposition was overruled and the framers of the constitution uh, near unanimously accepted the right to propagate religion they near unanimously uh, uh, decided to start the constitution to invoke the constitution by using the word we the people and here again it's interesting to note that i mean the words which they use is we the people they used were we the people it's not we the citizens it's not something else it is we the people which means that this constitution belongs to this country belongs to the entire people of this country i mean it's there is no question of any majority or in minority and kind of a uh, the chance for any majority and minority and kind of a dialectics it belongs to the entire people the constitution the, what the constitution promises is to the entire people of this country no matter what is your religion no matter whether you are an agnostic or you are you are, you are a religious believer or, 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 or whatever kind of thing this land belongs to the entire people this constitution belongs to the entire people therefore the promise of the constitution uh, are to the entire population of this country even again we um, should look that it's not the citizens they are saying it is the people because the people are larger than the citizen even people who are not uh, even people who were not at that point in time the citizens of this country this constitution belongs to them as well that is what uh, that is why they use the term uh, um, we the people to start the constitution and the second thing uh, again is about uh, about uh, fraternity the use of the word fraternity and uh, fraternity and uh, dignity of the individual you know that uh, if you look at the constituent assembly debates if you look at the constitution you could see that that was a definite contribution made by dr b r ambedkar dr b r ambedkar 
see the b r ambedkar has written a, a, a short constitution or, or a, pros, a future constitution he wrote a piece about the future constitution of independent india in his book the state and the minorities what are their rights and how to secure them in the indian constitution in that book he uh, tries to uh, put forward his concept about the future constitution and in that constitution if you look at you will see that uh, he uh, put forward uh, certain rights like for example uh, freedom from want freedom from fear i mean particularly the freedom from fear kind of a thing that re resonates well with the present day con context the indian indian context it has a contemporary relevance so freedom from want freedom from fe uh, fear and then uh, he put forward the uh, need for incorporating fraternity and dignity in the constitution and again uh, he argued for nationalization of industry and state ownership in land agriculture insurance and collective form farming and interestingly uh, ambedkar's notion of the constitution did not contain an equality clause he did not put forward an equality clause instead he put forward an inequality clause inequality clause he uh, that that read like this to remove all sorts of inequalities social political economic by securing by providing better opportunities for the submerged sections of the population that is what he had these are the words which he had used so it uh, it had an inequality clause rather than a equality clause so we could see that that was the uh, incorporation of the words in the indian constitution uh, fraternity and dignity where the contribution of uh, made by dr b r ambedkar see the when the constitutional assembly was sitting for framing the constitution they had uh, three important constitutions before them draft constitutions before them plus the objectives resolution of jawala nehru uh, the first draft of the constitution was uh, written by yemen royal that was in 1944 and it, it was called as the constitution of free india constitution of free india and the second uh, draft constitution was written by sriman narayan agarwal it was called as the gandhian constitution for free india constitution the gandhian constitution of free india the forward of their constitution was written by, written by mahatma gandhi and the third draft constitution was the draft constitution of the indian republic that was prepared by the socialist party and the forward of that constitution was written by j prakash narayan and then we had the objectives resolution and if you look at these four the three constitutions as well as the objectives resolution you could see that none of the constitutions and uh, and the objective resolution uh, referred to the word fraternity and dignity of the individual it is incorporated in one of the constitutions that is the constitution that was written by uh, sriman narayan agarwal the gandhian constitution of independent india that contains a uh, reference about uh, dignity of the individual and the other other two constitutions as well as the uh, objectives resolution of uh, jawaharlal nehru did not contain that also so you could see that uh, basically these were the, the incorporation of these two words in the constitution uh, was the contribution of dr b r ambedkar fraternity was one of the most important things which he wanted to include and he was success he succeeded in including uh, those uh, including that word and in fact uh, ambedkar said that what he wanted to incorporate was uh, maitri the term maitri maitri was a, uh, is a buddhist uh, concept and ambedkar believed that maitri is much more broader than uh, he, ambedkar believed that maitri was much more broader than uh, uh, fraternity because fraternity st uh, stands for uh, love between human beings and and maitri uh stands for love between uh, hum human beings and uh, non human beings between human beings and nature between man and nature man and man man and animals man and plant the, the enter the enter get the thing in other words man finding himself at, in harmony with the universe that is maitri in fact he want to incorporate maitri in the constitution but and that was that that uh, he was not able to uh, include it. and then the concept of uh, dignity he argued for the, uh, for you for uh, incorporating the word dignity in the constitution and he definitely def succeeded it and to ambedkar uh, dignity was much more important than breadth D 
dignity honor was much more important than the, the, than uh, any other kind of a thing as far as poor, uh, the submerged classes of the country were concerned i, I, I quote uh, ambassador says i quote if i may say so the servile classes do not care for social amelioration the want and po poverty which has been their lot is nothing to them as compared to the insult and indignity which they have to bear as a result of the vicious social order not bread but honor is what they want this is this this is what ambedkar has said i will i will read it once again if i may say so the servile classes do not care for social amelioration the want and poverty which has been their lot is nothing to them as compared to the insult and indignity which they have to bear as a result of the vicious social order not bread but honor is what they want and this particular sentence he gives it in uh, in italics not bread but honor is what they want that is what ambedkar has said and now the word was incorporated in the indian constitution and once the word was incorporated in the indian constitution there was another uh, point of dispute the dispute was about the uh, the ordering of the word where that word dignity has to be uh, incorporated if you look at the indian constitution you could see that towards the end of the uh, constitution at the end of the preamble it says fraternity assuring the dignity of the individual and the unity of the nation i will repeat fraternity assuring the dignity of the individual and the unity of the nation this is this is what we have now in the constitution and here before this these words are finalized this sentence is finalized patabi sidaramayya put forward an amendment sidaramayya put forward the, i mean sidaramayya wanted to wanted to reverse the order of the word he wanted to uh, incorporate the unity of the nation first and then dignity of the individual in other words the uh, the amendment moved by patabi sidaramayya read like this fraternity assuring the unity of the nation and the dignity of the individuals fraternity assuring the unity of the nation and the dignity of the individuals ambedkar uh, k m munshi and b n rao they all of them were opposed to uh, opposed it they said that nothing doing because ambedkar uh, argued that the unity of the nation can be preserved only if the dignity of the individual is assured so what is important what has to come first is unity the not the unity of the individual unity of the nation but the dignity of the individual only uh, people who have dignity can ensure national unity uh, national unity kind of a thing and and that was how he argued and finally uh, his argument carried uh, weight with the constant assembly and the constant assembly accepted the words in that order that is assuring the uh, dignity of the individual and the unity of the nation i tell you th this th this thing because in contemporary india this is a uh, all these things are a, 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 a disputed kind of a thing the kind of secularism which the constitution uh, promises the kind of fraternity the, the kind of uh, importance that the constitution gives to the individual kind of a thing all these are being questioned by certain political forces uh, which even even um, use the word uh, secularism derogatively as secularism kind of a thing so on and so forth even though the word secularism was not incorporated in india in the original text of the constitution there is no doubt that the framers of the constitution stood for secularism i mean they, they uh, in a in a religious society they wanted to uh, establish a, a, a secular state it is uh, what is affirmed by the framers of the constitution assembly so there was no doubt that the, about the intentions of the framers of the constitution there was no doubt whether you had the word secularism I, uh, or not whether it was incorporated later or not i mean the point is very clear they they they, they stood for uh, a strong secular democratic tradition where uh, individual is very uh, the role of the individual is very important and k m munshi had written a very beautiful book I, i will recommend that book to you some of i mean those of you who get time uh, or get, or get the book should read it the short title of the book is pilgrimage to freedom that is the short title the full title of the book is book is indian constitutional documents indian constitutional documents pilgrimage to freedom 
in that book in the pilgrimage to freedom munshi sasingli uh, summarizes the uh, role of dignity the role of uh, fraternity in the indian constitution i quote it implied an obligation on the part of the union to respect the personality of the citizen and to create conditions in which every citizen would be left free to find individual self fulfillment the incorporation of the then he comes to uh, to the specifics of dignity i quote the incorporation of the phrase dignity of the individual therefore was an express rejection of the hegelian hegelian theory on a hegelian theory on which modern totalitarianism is based namely that the state is a metaphysical entity independent of and overshadowing the individual whose only aim was to secure its existence it here means the nation's existence i will uh, read the uh, repeat the second paragraph again the incorporation of the phrase dignity of the individual therefore was an express rejection of the hegelian theory on which modern totalitarianism is based namely that the state is a metaphysical entity independent of and overshadowing the individual whose only aim was to secure its existence see the in 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 contemporary india where we speak about all these kinds of uh, kinds of a thing uh, i doubt whether uh, k munshi uh, envisage envisage this kind of a development uh, this kind of a denouement as far as the country is uh, concerned that is why he expressly says that the, the incorporation of the word dignity and fraternity uh, were definitely was made mainly to prevent uh, a totalitarian takeover kind of a thing in uh, in in future and also for ensuring the dignity of the individual ensuring the centrality of the individual and you read along with this what ambedkar said later later on ambedkar said that uh, individuals are not means to an end individual is an end in himself is an end in uh, in himself and he says that individuals are ends uh, in themselves and he then further says that individual is the primary unit in the indian constitution on which all rights are conferred all promises are made individual is the fundamental unit uh, on which all rights are conferred by the constitution and all uh, promises are made by the constitution and this lexical central uh, priority offered to the individual is the uh, real key to the philosophical centering of the individual in the indian constitution i mean if you look at the promises you could see that the promises centers the promises center around the individual uh, center around the individual and that is why i said that this philosophical centering of the individual and that depends on this lexical priority given to the uh, given to the individual and this uh centering of the uh, philosophical centering in the constitution stirs the possibility of establishing a dignified society of equal citizens and the foundational democratic vision is based on uh, this hope the, the foundational vision of india the democratic vision of india is based on this hope and it is this hope that is being challenged today it, it is this centrality of the promises that that were given that are given by the constitution to the people are being questioned uh, questioned today and there is a problem with the constitution problem with the constitution is that the pro the constitution cannot protect itself the constitution uh, can protect uh, everybody else the constitution can protect its uh, institutions but the constitution cannot protect itself we have to protect the uh, constitution and the conflict in india today is between a democratic constitution and a, democ and a democratic state at, uh, which is controlled by an undemocratic political party a uh, conflict is between i repeat a democratic constitution and a democratic state controlled by an undemocratic uh, political party the pro again the issue is that when an, when an undemocratic party controls a democratic state the state also becomes undemocratic and therefore 
the conflict is between a democratic constitution and an and an undemocratic uh, undemocratic uh, state see uh, democracy has its hardware democracy has its software both hardware and software are important just like the computer both the hardware and software are important as far as a democracy is concerned and the hardware of democracy uh, consists of the institutions consists uh, consists of uh, many legislature uh, executive judiciary uh, uh, then various other agencies bureaucracy all these things constitute the institutional edifice constitute the hardware of democracy and the software of the uh, uh, software of democracy is constituted by the constitutional values its promises kind of things so on and so forth the faith of the people and the ruling including the ruling class on the constitu on the constitutional values and the trust people have between themselves trust they have between themselves that is very significant and as far as india is concerned today what we find is that there is definitely a, a deficit on both kind of a thing there is a trust deficit and and um, there is a faith deficit which means that software has gone and there is also the hardware of the indian uh, state also the indian democracy uh, are also are also facing challenge so both hardware as well as software of indian democracy are facing severe severe challenges severe challenges and there was a political scientist uh, he was a lawyer as well he made very serious studies about uh, germany under hitler and uh, he has written he had written a book and the name of the political scientist he, uh, is ernest frankel ernest frankel and ernest frankel had written a book uh, the name of the book is the dual state the dual state and in the dual state he uh, analyzes the, um, the, the 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 german state under hitler and he points points of that in the book he points of that there were under uh, hitler two states one was a normative state and the other was a prerogative state so a normative normative state and a prerogative state and normative state is based on uh, rule of law it is based on democratic values it is based on the constitutional promises it is based on the constitutional values so on and so forth so it's it 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 it, it, it is norm based it is a uh, constitution bound kind of a thing uh, respecting rule of law respecting individual rights so on, so, so on and so forth and then there is the prerogative state which is the antithesis of all these things it never respects the rule of law it never respects democratic values it never respects the rights of the people it never respects the constitution so on and so forth so nothing of that sort this prerogative uh, state and i say that and he argued that uh, under hitler uh, these both both these, both these states were there uh, i argue that in every democracy in every every in every form of government you, you could find these two states you could find a, a, a normative state and you could find a, a, a prerogative a prerogative state and depending on the circumstances Uh, either the prerogative state will prevail or the normative state will prevail you give the right condition if you give the right condition even in a democracy the prerogative state will uh, flourish but at the same time that prerogative state will never uh, abolish the uh, normative state because of two reasons one is that capitalism always wants uh, a, a facade of the uh, normative state capitalism always wants a uh, rule of law for itself uh, norm based governance rule based governance for itself not for the people but for itself so capitalism want that that preservation of the uh, of the uh, normative state and the prerogative state also wants to preserve the normative state because uh, in the the question of legitimacy arises the the prerogative state always works uh, behind the normative state so it always places before it the normative state so that it can garner legitimacy from the legitimacy from the people because it can hoodwink the people by projecting the uh, normative state and acting under the shadow of the normative state you, uh, it could claim legitimacy that way so uh, the but the point is that the prerogative state 
will uh, uh, slowly uh, each will slowly um, listen to what control the normative state the prerogative state slowly controls it steals the powers of the all the effective powers of the normative state and the normative state will be reduced to a shell a shadow without substance but that shadow will be will be preserved and we are facing that kind of a, a situation and i will say that what we have today is a sort of uh, slow motion uh, dictatorship kind of a thing yes a, a dictatorship in slow motion kind of a thing but it is very sure the prerogative state is claiming the uh, uh, is controlling the uh, the normative uh, normative state kind of a thing and any conf any any uh, uh, what, what uh, reaction to it or any any uh, any any counter movement counter move to this kind of a uh, development has to be both political as well as social it has to be political in the sense that the political society we have to work in the political society to oppose these kinds of uh, trends but at the same time we shall we have also to work in the society because the society has already become uh, a prey to the machination of the uh, of the state and also as far as india is concerned i told you that the uh, the constitutional promises have a pre constitutional existence in india like that so already we had a tradition of respecting constitutional values democratic values and that tradition that value system ha has to be found in the subaltern movement which were organized even during the uh, pre independence period kind of a uh, kind of a thing and also in the indian literature if you look, if you look at it, you could see that indian literature also reflect this kind of values you, you i mean it is stated that indian literature has uh, 150 years of existence indian novel Uh, has about 150 years of existence and in this 150 years of uh, its existence whether it is novel literature poetry you cannot find even a single piece of literature which justifies fascism which justifies uh, dictatorship kind of thing so on and so forth which means that we have to dig deep into our tradition either literary tradition or this tradition of the subaltern movements and we have to uh, we have to borrow liberally from the the, the values from this kind of a thing and use it for mobilizing the people socially so both social mobilization and political mobilization are very important in this kind of a thing and here we should also use uh, beneficially cultural uh, metaphors which have a bearing in as far as the uh, uh, people are concerned which have a reflection in the everyday life of the people that that cultural metaphor that is very that is very important if you look at it, you could see that the bjp and other forces are using the Uh, using such metaphors to uh, mobilize people on their side the majoritarian kind of a thing but we will have to mobilize the uh, cultural metaphors which are with a universal kind of anarchy which are lying dormant which are lying latent in the uh, mind of the people kind of a thing and that will definitely help us to mobilize people uh, socially as uh, as well as politically and this twin strategy is important if we want to counter Uh, such moves which erodes the constitutional values thank you thank you very much